Uh, is there uh, anyone with a microphone? Here's the question here. We'll get you a microphone. Hi. Um, yeah, my, my name's Edwin. Um, I, I worked in theater for a number of years, and I just want to say we did a survey similar to what you did and found remarkably similar results that uh, we surveyed audiences over a period of a year and found that word of mouth was the number one biggest determinant for the success of a production. But the other thing we found was that having multiple uh, places where people got their information from, the more number, the higher number of different places you got information or insight into the production, the higher the the audience became so that you know re reviews and posters and uh, other you know radio spots would increase the audience and I thought that was played out exactly what your study showed so yeah. I just thought I'd share that. No, it's it, it's very similar. I mean, I think very similar audiences that are watching docs that are going to theater. Um, it's a crowded media landscape out there, and we're like bombarded with heaps of information um, in our devices and Astra, just that image of everything filtering and consolidating into one thing, you know, was a very good reminder of those machines that control us and are designed to do so. So how do you break through all of that noise um, when you have such an incredibly strong, powerful, I'm gonna say it, product that is a documentary? Um, it takes, you know, really, dynamic strategies and good marketing to do such a thing. And I, you know, I do see a lot of great films that are very successful in it. I think of Burt's Bees, I mean, and Jody's film. Of course, he had a globally, nationally, you know, known product, <laughs> literally, that the film was about, that does make it a bit easier. Um, but there's other films, there's another one called Street Photographer that played at Hot Docs last, not this year, but the year before. Um, and it's about a bunch of street photographers in, New York, I think I got the name right. And there's about seven photographers featured in the film. They all have agents, they all have galleries, and all of them have mailing lists. And the filmmaker thought, you know what? This film, it's not gonna go to HBO. It's not going to a bunch of big broadcasters, but if I do it on Vimeo On Demand, and I work these you know, seven um, galleries lists, and really in a good, strong way, I'm gonna be able to, you know, earn some money off this film, and he has. I mean, in about a year, that film has done fairly well, just on Vimeo On Demand. So understanding like exactly who your audience is, knowing directly how to communicate them, delivering the message that they're gonna be able to hear that's coming through their feeds, you know, is the way to you know, create that home for your film and ideally create you know, some revenue back to yourself. Yeah, to, I mean, to underscore that, I'm, as we're talking here, I'm kind of thinking back that you know, 10 years ago when I came to uh, events like this, there weren't that many, uh, the word marketing did not come up in, in documentary uh, gatherings that much. Marketing, I, to simplify things, would be you know, something that you imagined a distributor was gonna do or a TV station was gonna do. And documentary filmmaking, that is like, you know, crap, coming up with an idea, going out in the field, shooting it, uh, editing it, that was something you do as a, as a filmmaker. Marketing is something someone else does. Uh, for, uh, for better or for worse, I think that's uh, changing, and, um, and I think that, uh, that marketing is something that, uh, that uh, filmmakers um, need to do. And uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm sure there are people who think, you know what, it's, it, it's enough of a job just going out and shooting and editing I'd really rather let marketing uh, belong to uh, to someone else, um, and you know, and there are, there are filmmakers uh, who uh, who hold that position, and and if they can make it work for them, um, that's uh, great. But you know, really, what we're talking about here, and uh, what we want to come out of Doc Conference, is more strategies for sustainable careers as uh, as documentary filmmakers, and. And uh, when I look at um, uh, you know, tools like uh, VHX uh, with Adam Claff uh, here uh, yesterday, um, tools that's, you know, that allow you as filmmakers to uh, put a film on your own website, uh, take the, the majority of revenue yourself instead of a, uh, a, 
you know, sharing it with, a, with another distributor. Um, that is, you know, that, that to me is a real sign of, uh, of hope for a sustainable career. Now, in order to get viewers uh, to your website, in order to make that sale, is going to take marketing. And, uh, and, you know, and, and that's why I think it's important that we, we have this conversation and that we, can, and that we use um, uh, our talents to, um, to, to extend into that too. Yeah. And I completely agree with you. I think that it's hard to also like, ask the filmmaker, like, filmmaker, okay, can you go find all your funding? Maybe you're gonna do crowdfunding and then can you make a really damn good film? And then can you market it and bring it out to your audience? It's a tall order. And I do think that there's, you know, a better, um, filmmakers are better served when working with, like, a great marketing partner. I think about what Mark does at uh, Bond360 and several others. And I, I think that, is certainly I can speak to the Canadian marketplace, there's a gap in the, you know, uh, service companies around documentary filmmakers that could be supporting, you know, this type of work. Um, I see that also on the impact producing side. I, there's an area for growth there. Like, we could maybe use a couple of marketing companies for documentary films in Canada doing this type of work. Like, I think it's possible. So, potential future career there for someone who decides they don't wanna make films anymore. Um, but, but I mean it, because I see these companies uh, in the US where, yes, there's a much larger market share and also, you know, in in Europe and in the UK, but I certainly, you know, think that there's a place for that here, um, and it could address a lot of these, you know, issues that we talked to. I see a hand in the back. Uh, what's the market for non-English documentaries? I'm so happy you asked because it was in my notes for the last thing I wanted to mention. Um, the majority of the films that we you know, took a look at on platforms across the board are English-speaking documentaries. Um, there's a high cost associated with subtitles and translations, and especially even versioning out into other territories. So those non-English-speaking films, dare I say, suffer in these spaces, um, especially on the VOD and SVOD platforms. Is that changing and is it growing? Yes, um, but I, I definitely think that there's a need to you know, take into account all the non-English speaking films that certainly deserve distribution, you know, in Canada and around the world. There's many titles that come out of our festival and I know here as well that you think two, three, two or three years later, like, you know, where's Steam of Life? Where's Sophia's Last Ambulance? You know, you Google them, I dare you to find them on an online platform right now. And they're, they're not, they're just not translated. They're just not here, even though they may have played major broadcasters. So it just, there's a huge section and sector of films that are non-English speaking that I, we need to see on these platforms and, and deliver to these audiences. They're looking for them. It's, it's cost, it's versioning and cost, it's translation, and it's also, you know, the rights holder. I think there's also two things between um, the platforms saying, well, there's not a big demand. People don't want to read subtitles. Um, I think there's an opportunity for further study into that, um, but I, I certainly think that's an area of film that's underserved on the VOD and SVOD platforms. Okay. Uh. Yeah, the only thing I have a problem with with subtitles is uh, subtitles that can't be seen uh, when they're on the screen. If like if they're in white and you get a white background, then then the words disappear. So they so if you take enough care, make the subtitles big enough and have them maybe outlined in, with, with some kind of black so it can be read, then really I don't have, as a per my personal view is I don't have any problem with subtitles. We're gonna note that for our research. Good to know. Um, we've got time for uh, a couple more questions or, or comments, or if you want to, uh, we've got a hand down here. Hi, I'm just going back to your, um you talked about uh, releasing a, a film at Hot Docs and then uh, also on iTunes. Yes. Do you know, uh, I, I'm sure it's their first time doing that and the numbers aren't huge, but can you tell us what the numbers, I'm just curious what, what kind of, how Hot like Docs would iTunes perform. I iTunes people would have my neck. No, I can't tell you, of no. course not, but I'll tell you at the cocktail party. Um, right. <laughs> can't tell you into this microphone. Um, it, it, was an, it was an interesting experiment, and it was one that, you know, we helped to connect the filmmakers to iTunes or the, or the rights holders to do this. And, and we just thought, we knew this is what 
I mean, a bit from the research and a bit from our gut feeling and then confirmed by the research that, you know, audiences are looking for docs in more places at more times and, and let's maximize convenience and let's test this out. Let's have this experiment and see what happens. And how can we play off the momentum of the marketing that was being driven around the release at the festival? And, you know, if you're not in the GTA and maybe you live in Moose Jaw, you still want to see the film, right? Because you're a big fan of, you know, uh, Ai Weiwei, because one of the films was The Fake Case. Um, it just made sense. I, the numbers were very strong and surprising at a premium price. So rather than being like $9.99, it was like $14.99. So that, you know, compounds nicely when you get up into the many hits. Um, yeah, question way in the back. on, I guess, marketing, you were talking, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, just on marketing, and you were saying that I think most filmmakers wouldn't want to market. I think that it's really important that filmmakers think about the way that they engage the truth of their story um, as part of their marketing. That the audience, it, it, when you see a movie, when you see a documentary, you're relating to the truth of that story. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they should get to the truth of the audience before they go to distribution, because I think that that's incredibly important. And another comment I'm, I'd like to make is just about eventizing, which is that I think documentary has an op opportunity to, to truly be the event. You know, that it's not just a movie they're releasing, it's an event and it's an experience, it's a campaign, it's an activation. And I just wanted to ask, because this is a very interesting study, but I think it's really important also to the gentleman from the UK who made a point over there, is how, how are you as, as this incredibly powerful brand going to really engage with people who would never watch documentaries? Um, in the so future. I'm going to do another study, okay? Great. <laughs> We're going to do that. <laughs> One study per summer, all right? Um, but no, it's a, that's a wonderful point, and I think I, I can echo all of your sentiment around, you know, eventizing and marketing and understanding, you know, the brand of the filmmaker itself or the brand of the company creating the films. Um, there's a lot of open space for growth there and for understanding, you know, how to communicate with authentic voice, you know, to your audience. And I'll say this, you know, Marketing is just a different expression of pitching, right? You pitch to your financiers, you're doing it for one aim. When you market a film out to your audience, it's a different story that you're telling to a different group for a different aim, but it's a very similar process in happening. You know, you're, you're making the case as to why they should watch it and understanding how to communicate to them. So you have that in your DNA. You have some of those tools already in your toolkit. You know, it's just a different expression of it. That's my take. Time for one more question. No. Uh, the ones that would go to the theater seem to be the older people, right? And so once they get sick or die off, we're going to have to ha deal with the younger audience. And I sometimes think they're more interested in watching it than on Netflix, especially if they've got kids, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we're one, you know, I keep wondering that the theatrical stuff will go for us and that we'll just be dealing with, uh, um, you know, the screens. Yeah, and that's... Two interesting points there. You're completely right. Younger audiences who are used to watching an SVOD, those become lifetime, lifelong habits, you know? We're like, what do you want to do tonight, honey? Yeah, let's just watch Netflix. You know, it becomes that um, part of your fiber. And I, and I think you're completely right. We may, as those audiences get older, they may not want to go to theaters. What I will say is that um, I don't... I mean, in that traditionalist group that is, yes, mostly older, there are equal proportions of younger segments who are part of that traditional groups for that 18 to 35 and then like 35 to 55. So they were equally proportioned there. Um, so there's still folks who, although it's smaller, you're right, they love the theater experience. They want to be with the butter and the popcorn and the whole thing. And they also want the connection and the interaction after. So I don't think it's going to go away forever, but will it take some strategic ways to bring people into theaters and event ties and create other elements so that we get people outside of just festivals coming to theaters to watch docs and not just in Toronto where we have a beautiful culture of it, but in cities across Canada? Yeah, we're going to have to do more to make that happen. Because the, the, the timing is so short now because everybody's working 24-7, and so it's much harder for them to run to a theater and I watch it. Don't they deserve a night element. out? I think they do. <laughs> Um, I want to uh, bring uh, Christoph Staub uh, to, the, to the stage. Uh, he works in our industry programs. I think he's got uh, a, a special offer to make for people who have doc conference passes. Christoph, you say your words, and I'll just give a few closing words when okay. you're done. Great. Well, thanks. And first of all, congratulations on an amazing doc conference, Tom, again. Um, 
as most of you hopefully know that uh, we'll have one final day of programming here at the industry conference tomorrow called The Future of Cinema. And in a series of four sessions, we will explore what the future of cinema might look like in the next 10 years, from immersive event cinema experiences to the infinite possibilities of virtual reality, from large, uh, large screen formats uh, like IMAX to the high frame rate projection of 120 frames per second. Guest speakers will include well, Fabien Rigal, you just heard from him at the very back, founder of Secret Cinema in the UK, Palmer Lucky, the founder of Oculus VR, Jade Raymond, managing director of Ubisoft Toronto, and visual effects pioneer Douglas Trumbull, among many others. The day includes showcases of some of the latest technology, technological developments, and we're really excited about offering you, the Doc Conference Pass holders, access to tomorrow's day. So if you have a Doc Conference Pass, just show up tomorrow, as of 9.30, doors will open. 10 a.m., it's Fabien Regal from Secret Cinema, State of Future of Cinema address, and we'll be here in the morning, and then we'll be at a variety of other locations throughout the day, and you can look that up in our industry conference brochure. Thank Thanks you so much. very much, Christoph. Value add to your documentary conference pass. Uh, before we uh, wrap up, I, uh, for documentary lovers in the audience, I want you to know at 6 o'clock today, in half an hour, uh, The Look of Silence is playing at Scotiabank uh, Theater. Uh, I think it's the last screen of the film that, uh, that the filmmaker Joshua Oppenheimer, who you may have heard speak this morning, um, will be at. It's a terrific film. I encourage you to check it out. At 9.30 tonight is uh, the new Nick Broomfield film, uh, Tales of the Grim Sleeper playing at TIFF uh, Bell Lightbox. Um, it's a terrific film, it's uh, one of his best. Um, and, uh, and there's plenty more documentaries uh, ahead. Uh, well, you know, one I would um, encourage you to take a look at is uh, National Diploma, uh, a film from the Congo. Uh, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that its filmmaker is gonna uh, make it here for those uh, screenings this week. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, participating in, in Doc Conference. I want to thank especially Amanda Brayson and Dorota Leck, my colleagues who helped uh, put this on. I want to thank Aaron, our stage manager, and everyone at the Glenn Gould Auditorium for running a great show. Um, and thank you to Elizabeth for um, closing us out. See you next year. <laughs>